morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank Rohit for inviting me here to give this talk. I'm not a great orator, so I don't speak very well. So you have to bear with me. Secondly, optics. Our biometry is optics, and optics being part of physics is very hard, very technical. And technical talk is not easy to be given in a tech format, but I'll try my best. Now, biometry is essentially outcomes. It is not sexy, but it is simply the most important back office things. It is not front office. It is not something we can talk to patients a lot, but it is essentially outcome. When we do LASIK, we do a refraction. When we prescribe glasses, we do refractions and then you use that to determine the power or the amount of treatment for LASIK or for glasses. For cataract, the IOL power is essentially determined by one and only thing and that is biometry. And that's why it is so important. Biometry is simple yet complex. But fortunately today, most of this complexity has been removed. And all you need is to do the biometry, the system will churn out the outcome, the number for you, easy. And today, it's a lot better because it is not just a simple equation, it is a very complex computational power calculation, and the computer has taken over that. Now, the eye is essentially a two-lens system. We all know there's a cornea, and then there is the lens. In cataract, we are essentially exchanging the lens from a normal crystalline lens, an opaque crystalline lens, to an artificial lens. The cornea contributes one third, two thirds of the refractive power of the eye. The lens, the IOL, contribute one third of the refractive power of the eye. Now the cornea power is easy. It is there, it is on the surface. But where does the IOL sit? There lies the big issue and the biggest confounder in IOL power calculation. In the past, we determined where the IOL sit based on regression. We correct, collect the post-op data, we churn out, we regress, and we think that's where the IOL sit. But today, we know it's better, we can use theoretical formula to predict based on the relationship, because the eye has a relationship on the axial length of the eyeball which we measure and the corneal power. All right, so that is the theoret theoretical position of the lens. Now, the next thing we need to know is the position of the lens, we call it the effective lens position. We need to calculate that, all right, and its relationship with the cornea power, the radius of curvature, and the axial length. From there, we determine where the effective lens power is. Now, the effective lens power is an optical position. It is not a physical position. For physical position, we use the term lens haptic plane. That's where the lens sits in the eye, but that is not necessarily the optical position of the eye. Well, the optical position is something more abstract, but I will explain more on this. So this is regression versus theoretical. Today, really, a lot of the determination of the position of the IOL is a combination of theoretical with a bit of regression. We look at, sorry, I think this has gone too far. Oh, can we go back? Sorry. Then we look at thin lens versus thick lens. In the past, for simplicity, all our power calculation is based on thin lens. We assume 
the lens is just a single plane, we ignore everything else. All right? That is easy. Even the corneal, we ignore the corneal thickness. We assume that it is a single plane. The IOL, we assume we disregard the front curvature. We disregard the posterior curvature. We disregard the thickness. We assume that it is a single plane. And that is fine because in the past, we do not have the kind of computational power. A simple equation for the thin lens is easy. It doesn't require too much. And it works very well for most axial length, normal axial length. But it starts to fail. As today, cataract is becoming refractive surgery, and more and more patients at the extreme axial length come in, and then we find that the power is off. If you look at the first chart here, this is the effect of axial length. The, the, this is long axial length on this side, on the right side, and the short axial length on the left side. You'll find that a lot of thin lens formula, the conventional formula, the Hoffer Q, the Holiday 1, even the Holiday 2, the SRKT, SRK2 disregarded, that's a regression based lens uh, formula. They all are not very useful. The SRK2, as you can see here, this is SRK2, is terrible with axial length. All right, it's only good right at the center where everything are close to one another, but once it gets too long, it gets too short, it is terrible. So don't ever use SRK2, it's a regression based formula. But for the rest of the formula, you can see that with long axial length, they tend to underestimate the power of the IOL. As a result, post-operatively, patients end up with high peropia. So if the axial length is more than 26, or more than 28 and the longer, the worse it is, as you can see here. But good news is there are some new formulas here. You can see that it's flat. These are the later generation formula. These are the Barrett formula, the EVO formulas, as well as the RBF formula. The EVO and Barrett formulas make use of thick lens. They need information more information from the IOL company. You, they don't actually ask for it. They predict it in a way. They need more data to help predict where exactly the physical position of the IOL, and from there it moves to calculate based on the thickness and the curvature of the individual IOL. The other problem is with K, the effect of corneal power. All right, again, SRK2 is terrible. But here you can see that some formula like Huygens is not very good with corneal power, especially triple optimized Huygens. It has a bad relationship with K. The steeper the cornea, the less is estimate, and up post op patient become hyperopic. The flatter the cornea, it overestimate and a patient becomes myopia. But there are again some formulas here, EVO, Barrett, that have an RBF that has done very well. Alright, what's so special about this IOL? Like I explained in the past, most of the formulas are based on equations and that is thin lens formula. EVO and Barrett has gone one step Further, thick lens are not easy to calculate. All right? It depends on the curvature, the front curvature, the curvature of the back, the thickness of the IOL at the center. And different IOLs, some the thickness varies, some the thickness remains the same, some the curvature varies, some the curvature remains the same throughout the different formula, different power. So for Barrett's and Evo, what they do is they use a simple equation, calculate a baseline, and then use computational power to reiterate based on the thick lens formula to find the final power of the IOL. The RBF uses artificial intelligence, but to do artificial intelligence, first you must gather the data, 
the post-operative data, you run an artificial intelligence program, in this case it's radio basis function, over the 10,000 of eyes, and then from there the artificial intelligence will determine base the next, when you input the next parameter, what is the, the power it should be. Right? So that's why now we are moving away from equations to iteration and artificial intelligence. Essentially, roughly, we can divide it, the world is divided into three. The Europeans still prefer to use equations, but the equation has gotten very complex. The Americans prefer to use artificial intelligence, and that's Warren Hill. While in Asia, in this part, Australia, and in Singapore, where we develop the EVO, we use iterations. Now, here is to show you the different IOL. The different shape of the IOL, thin lens formula, you assume that it is in center. All right? But the actual optical center plane, principal plane of this IOL, for this IOL, is different from here different from here, different from here, and different from here. For this, it's probably right in the center. For this, it's probably more anterior. This is even more anterior, all right? And so on and so on. So using lens haptic plane doesn't make sense anymore. The optical position changes as the ROL power changes, as the ROL thickness changes. And you need a lot of computational power to estimate that. Just to give you an example, these two lenses are the same. The angulation is the same, but the design of the lens is different. One is posterior biconvex, the other is anterior asymmetric biconvex. It's made by the same company. But look at the A constant. Look at the A constant here. This is the ULIP. That is different. Why is it different? Because the optical plane, we are not talking about the lens haptic plane, we are not talking about the physical plane, change. Because of the curvature is now different. And that's why A concern is so important in IOL. But the newer formula like EVO and Barrett, A constant is still important. I'll tell you why it's important, but it is not so critical anymore. But the design of the lens is much more important. All right, because for example, this one, the thicker the lens, the A constant actually change. Okay, the, because A constant is something physical, something arbitrary. Another example, aspheric versus non-aspheric. All right, this is aspheric, this is non-aspheric. But look at the A constant here, 118.8 and 119. They're similar lens. The aspheric generally have a higher A constant than the non than the spheric, the non-aspheric, because by design of the spherical aberration, the, the, the optical plane is slightly more posterior than the spheric IOL, and therefore the A constant must be a little bit higher. So this essentially explains why different IOL have different oil constant, same IOL, different curvature, different optical design have different A constant. But A constant is not just about optical design. Optical design is one and it's population based because of the different excellence as I explained earlier on. But no matter what, today there are still sources of errors. No matter how good your machine is, they're still not perfect. Humidity, the ambience lighting, the temperature of the environment will affect the measurement. And that is why we strongly recommend that, that at the beginning of the day, before you start with the first patient, always calibrate your biometers. Here it shows that this is a few years ago, formula is post-operative anterior chamber depth, that's the ELP. P. Formula is the biggest culprit. Today, formulas are a lot better. This was before EVO and Barrett's. Refraction is still very subjective. It still varies. George Waring, Waring said, 
the refraction is varies by half a diopter every different day. So this is something you must take into consideration. All right, the axial length now is less of a problem. Okay, and then there are other some minor factors. If you have short axial length, the sources of error is higher because the thick lens, a slight displacement, the impact is a lot higher than a thin lens. For example, a zero diopter lens, you can put it anywhere in the eyeball, theoretically speaking. It won't affect the outcome because it's zero diopter, but in reality, it does because the lens has thickness. All right, so the shorter axial length is worse. Aspheric versus spheric. The spheric actually contribute more arrows in post-op outcomes than aspheric. That's why we are all moving towards aspheric because it's much more precise. And today, we are working very hard to solve these major sources of error. If we can solve these major sources of error tomorrow, these small things here will become the main issue. Just like refractive surgery, we have now taken good care of lower order aberration, the higher order aberration becomes more critical. All right, so this is the sources of error. It will still be there. We will still have a bit of errors. So with that, I thank you very much. I hope I've given you some summary of our power calculation and biometry.